as I said, um, we're going to be working on transient analysis. of uh, first order circuits. And we are gonna start with an RL circuit. So let me draw that really quickly. Here is our resistor R. Here is our inductor L. These are connected in parallel. Over to the left here, we are going to have a current source that is going to drive a current IS. Like so. And I'm going to have a switch now. And this is our first time I'm really dealing with switches, actually. Uh, I'm going to fill in that dot. I'm going to put an open dot over here and an open dot over here as well. And connect things like so. Uh, I'm going to call this terminal A over here on the right and this terminal B over here on the left. And our switch is going to be closed at position A until some time. that our switch changes from being, being closed at B. And we're gonna call this point in T is equal to zero, okay? So for this circuit, we really have two different points in time, okay? Um, we have T is less than zero minus, And then we have T is greater than or equal to zero plus. So for T is less than zero minus, our circuit is at DC steady state. So when our circuit is at DC steady state, that means that we can literally just treat it as if it were a DC circuit without missing any information whatsoever, right? So we're kind of working under a little bit of an assumption here. And the assumption is that our uh, system has been in this state for a very long time. So our switch has been closed at position A for a very, very long time. And what constitutes a very, very long time, we'll talk about in a little bit when we get to the concept of time constants, okay? For T greater than or equal to zero plus, our circuit is in a transient condition. That simply means that it is undergoing some sort of change that will influence the behavior of currents and voltages in our system. So let's talk about the quantities that we might be interested in, okay? The main quantity that we would be interested in in a RL circuit like this would be our inductor current, which I'm gonna call IL of T. Secondary thing that we might be interested in would be the voltage drop across our inductor, the voltage drop across our resistor, or the current flowing through our resistor. And I'm calling these secondary quantities because we have to understand how the inductor current behaves in order to have any understanding about how any of those three quantities in blue behave, okay? So for now, we are going to focus our analysis on figuring out what's going on with that inductor current as time progresses in this system, 
Okay. So, let's identify a couple of important points, right? So we have an understanding right now, T is less than zero minus, we're at DC steady state, T greater than zero plus, uh, which is the moment in time after the switch has changed state, we're in a transient condition. Uh, condition. Let's analyze the circuit. at t is equal to zero minus specifically, okay? So at t is equal to zero minus, our switch is closed at position A. So our terminal B here is just going to be really an open circuit. Here is our current source, IS, connected to power resistance R. Connected to our inductance, L. But because we're at T is equal to zero minus, DC steady state, we're going to replace our inductor with its DC equivalent. And as we learned uh, a week ago, uh, in a DC circuit, an inductor looks like a short circuit. So here is our inductor current, IL of zero minus, okay? At T is equal to zero minus, effectively, this is going to represent how the circuit is behaving for all time less than zero minus. So for all points in time to the moment right before the switch changes state. So we should be able, for this particular example, to solve for our inductor current just by inspection. Uh, by that, I mean we should be able to look at the circuit and see what the inductor current is. So does anybody have any thoughts on what that might be? Would we do something like nodal analysis? Nodal analysis is complete and utter overkill here. I, I don't want us to do any analysis whatsoever. I firmly believe that we can just look at this circuit with our current level of circuits knowledge and figure out what's going on. So I have a resistor in parallel with a short circuit. What does that mean? The yeah. resistor and the short circuit are going to have the same. They're going to have the same what? Uh, current for I. So whenever two elements are in parallel, Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us that they have to have the same voltage drop over them, right? So if I were to put a voltage here, let's call it positive polarity on top, negative polarity on bottom, and I'm just gonna call this voltage V, what would the value of this voltage be? What's the voltage drop over a short circuit by definition for this class? Zero? Yes. So because short circuits don't have any resistance, Ohm's law tells us that regardless of the amount of current flowing through the short, the voltage is always going to be zero volts. What is the consequence of the voltage drop across a resistor being zero volts? That, that, it, that it shorts, that it's just a short circuit? Well, so, the resistor isn't a short circuit, it has some resistance, but the current flowing through it has to be zero, right? Because if the voltage is zero and V is equal to I times R, 
I must be zero if R is any finite value, right? So this current must be zero amps. And that's true anytime we have a resistor in parallel with a short circuit, all that means is that any current is going to bypass the resistor and flow through the short instead. So with that understanding, what's the current flowing through the inductor, which is a short circuit at DC steady state? Would it, would it, it would be zero, right, zero? I disagree. Okay. So we have this current IS. It's gonna flow up from this current source and then it's gonna flow to the right because that's the only path that it has. And now it sees two branches. One branch contains a resistor and the other branch contains a short circuit. All of it is gonna bypass the resistor and flow through the short before coming back around and flowing up through here. Would it be, would the current then be IS? Exactly right. So the current flowing through our inductor at T is equal to zero minus must be IS. So when we are at DC steady state, we should expect a DC current to be flowing through our inductor. Now, when we talked about inductors, um, I guess it was about a week ago at this point, um, we learned that there is energy stored in an inductor when current flows through it, right? So we came up with a relationship. W, I'm going to put sub L here because this is specifically for inductors, was equal to one half times the inductor value times the inductor current squared. And I'm using capital letters for everything here because we're dealing with a DC circuit. So, assuming that IS is non-zero, that means that our inductor has some amount of energy stored in it, right? So now we're going to look at what happens for T greater than zero plus, okay? So we have a good understanding of what's happening for all points in time before our switch changes state. Now we're gonna to try to figure out what's going on after our switch changes states, okay? So, uh, actually, so four, P greater than or equal to zero plus, okay? So now our current source is going to be connected to terminal B and terminal A is going to be open, okay? So here's our current source, IS closed at B, A is open here. Here we have our resistor. Our circuit is no longer at DC steady state because something has changed. And if something changes, we're no longer at DC steady state. So my inductor is now going to behave like an inductor. So I'm gonna put L there. And our goal is to figure out what's going on for IL of T, where T is greater than or equal to zero plus here, okay? So this particular part here isn't going to be terribly easy, nor is it going to be terribly difficult. Um, but I, I want to warn you, I guess, that we're going to be doing a little bit of calculus here. And we're actually going to wind up solving a differential equation, which not all of you have had the opportunity to do before. So we're going to go about it in a 
maybe a, a different approach than what you've seen in your classes, okay? Um, so I want to describe what's happening to you first, okay? So at t is equal to zero minus, the current flowing through our inductor was equal to Is, right? We saw that by analyzing our circuit at t is equal to zero minus. Now, one of the things that we learned about inductors is that the current flowing through an inductor cannot change abruptly. So what that means is that the current uh, IL, let me do lowercase here, at t is equal to zero plus must be equal to IL at zero minus, which would be I, uh, IS in this case, okay? So at the specific instant in time, after the switch change states, the current flowing through the inductor cannot have changed, okay? which means our inductor still has some amount of energy stored in it. And effectively, it's going to push current through whatever it's connected to, okay? Now, whatever it's connected to here is a resistor. Well, what does a resistor do? It converts electrical energy into heat. So what we are going to observe is that all of the energy stored in the inductor will be converted into heat over time, okay? Since the energy stored by the inductor is decreasing, that means the current flowing through the inductor decreases over time, okay? So as the inductor loses energy or transfers its energy to the resistor, the inductor current is gonna gradually get smaller and smaller and smaller until a point in time where all of the energy that was stored by the inductor has been converted into heat by the resistor. That's what's happening during the transient condition. What we're gonna do now is figure out how to describe that mathematically, okay? So what I'm going to do is I am going to write a first order differential equation for this system, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wind up writing a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this right-hand loop, which contains the resistor and the inductor. I'm gonna choose to express my inductor voltage with positive polarity on top, and I'm going to choose to express my resistor voltage with positive polarity on bottom. Okay. Now this might seem a little bit odd. The reason why I'm doing this is so that my inductor current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal of both elements so that I don't have to introduce any negative signs or anything like that to take care of things. So, I'm going to write a KVL equation starting from my bottom left-hand corner here. And so I'm gonna have, so let's write KVL. I'm gonna have VR of T plus VL of T is equal to zero. That must be true for all points in time because Kirchhoff's voltage law is the law of conservation of energy for circuits, okay? What I can do now is I can express both of those voltages in terms of that current IL, right? So using Ohm's law, I can express VR as R times IL, and using our derivative-based relationship that we learned when we were dealing with inductors, I can express VL as L times the derivative of IL with respect to time. These equal to zero. 
So what I have here is a first order homogeneous differential equation, okay? That, if you haven't had Math 245, might sound terrifying. Um, how we are going to solve this is we are going to think about what we have, okay? So my goal here is to determine the form of our inductor current, okay? And we really have enough information to have to make a pretty good guess as to what's going on here uh, because I need effectively um, for my function and the derivative of my function to be able to add together and make zero, which means that my function and its derivative have to have effectively the same form, right? So that means polynomials are out because if I had, you know, t squared as i l of t, then the derivative would be 2t, and there's no way that t squared plus or minus 2t is going to equal zero kind of all the time, right? It'll, it'll work for specific values of t, but it won't work for all values of t. So polynomials are out. Um, a guess that is commonly made by students um, is sinusoidal functions. That's not really going to work out either um, because the derivative of sine is cosine and adding a sine function and a cosine function, it can be done, but you're going to have weird phase angles and things like that that you have to take into account. So sinusoidal functions are out as well. So the only other type of function that might possibly work would be an exponential function. Since the derivative of an exponential function is an exponential function, it stands to reason that an exponential function plus or minus an exponential function might be able to make zero, okay? So we are going to make an educated guess here that our inductor current, I L of T, will be of the form A, where A is an arbitrary constant, and we'll figure out what that is and how it relates to our circuit here in a moment. Uh, times e to the s t, okay, where s is what's called the eigenvalue of the system in math speak, um, and it's what we are going to refer to as the natural frequency of the system, okay? So it's going to tell us this natural frequency, or s, when we figure out what it is, is going to tell us how our signal exponentially grows if s happens to be positive or how it exponentially decays if s happens to be negative. Based on what we were talking about earlier, seeing our current gradually go from i s down to zero, my best guess is that s is going to be some negative quantity. And so we're going to see this uh, system exponentially decay. So if I substitute in this guess value, I'm going to have R times A E to the S T plus L times the derivative with respect to time of A E to the S T is equal to zero. And now I'm going to do that derivative. So that's going to give me R A E to the S T plus S L A E to the S T is equal to zero. And now I'm going to do just a touch of algebra here. So I will have A times R plus S L times E to the st is equal to zero. So now we have an equation with this guess value that's 
leading us towards how this thing is going to behave, okay? Now, our goal here is to figure out what value of S makes this thing equal to zero because we have a couple of different solutions that'll make this thing work, right? So if A was zero, then this equation would obviously be equal to zero regardless of what S is, regardless of what T is. That represents a trivial solution. Effectively, a system where A is equal to zero means that our current source is supplying zero amp so that we start with no energy stored. Um, so while that is a solution, it doesn't really describe what we're trying to do here because it's not a transient problem if we never had any energy stored in our system and we're no we're, we're not watching how it gets transferred. Okay. E to the st will approach zero if s is negative and we wait long enough, right? But that's not really what we're looking for either. So instead, we're going to figure out what's going on with this middle bit right here, which is called the characteristic equation for our system. So for a specific value of S, that quantity R plus SL will always equal to zero. Well, for this system, that simply means that S is equal to negative R over L. So if S has that particular value, then R plus SL will always be equal to zero and our guess works. So we're gonna update this and say that we have uh, the form of our inductor current is a e to the negative r over l times time so the last thing that we have to figure out is what that arbitrary constant a is okay. so a represents the magnitude effectively, of our exponential decay here. So what I mean by that is it's what value we started at, and then that's going to gradually decay down towards zero as time increases, okay? So another way to think about A is it's the initial condition on our system. It's the value that our, in this case, inductor current had right as the transient condition started. Well, if we scroll up here, we can see that we took note to say that IL at zero plus was equal to IS. Generally speaking, we could write this as IL at zero plus is just our value of A, and then we'll have E excuse me, to the minus R over L times time. And this is how our inductor current is going to behave in any first order RL circuit. So, from here on out, we no longer have to do this calculus again. This is literally how the inductor current will behave in any first order circuit, where a first order circuit means it can be represented by a single equivalent resistance and a single equivalent inductance. Okay. Dr. Hartman, on that last equation there, that is negative RLT, right? That is correct. So okay. IL at zero plus times E to the negative. R divided by L times time. All right, sounds good. Okay. So, yeah, man, quick one. Go for it. So, so for so, I guess like what this looks like is is like so it's a piecewise function if we include that the zero negative right, mm -hmm. and then so the the other side of that 
is just a function with respect to time. And then I guess, depending on, so like a question might look like we have a, a circuit like this, and then we say calculate the, the current in the inductor at time T. Um, and then we, then we would get the current from this equation. Is that correct? Absolutely. That is 100% what I'm going to ask you. Okay. Okay. So I'm sorry. mathematically describe how the inductor current behaves here. Okay. Now, um, so let me, let, let me do two things. First, I want to draw a picture um, because of something that you just said, Christopher. You're 100% you're correct. We have effectively a piecewise function, right? So if we were to plot, sorry, my screen is scrolling on me. I L of T as a function of time for this particular circuit, it would look something like this. Our current Sorry, I'm going to change that to blue. Our current would be constant until we hit T is equal to zero. And then when we hit T is equal to zero, we are going to see an exponential decay like so, right? So up here, we have IL of zero minus, which is really IS. And for this portion of the curve, we have I L at zero plus times E to the negative R over L times tau. Okay. So 100% correct that we have a piecewise function. Um, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to subdivide this graph up. Okay, so everything from here to here, so for all time less than zero minus, we have DC steady state. From here to here, we have what's called our transient condition. And then I'm going to maybe do something a little odd here mathematically. I'm going to call this time t is equal to infinity. Okay. What this really represents is just a very long time after the switch change states. Um, and so our transient condition has died out. And so beyond T is equal to infinity, we're back at a DC steady state condition. We're going to see um, how circuits behave effectively beyond T is equal to infinity uh, in our next class meeting. So I'm just kind of setting some things up there. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is we have a good mathematical description of how our inductor current behaves. Let's see now how, let's say, the inductor voltage, the resistor voltage, and things like that behave. Okay, so if we wanted to get an expression for our resistor voltage vr of t well ohm's law tells us that it's just going to be r times il of t right so let me scroll down here to another page so we could say that vr of t is just r times il of t which is just going to be R times I L at zero plus E to the negative R over L T. 
for t greater than or equal to zero plus, which is where we found out how our current behaves, right? Well, what does r times i l at zero plus represent? This is just the voltage drop across the resistor at t is equal to zero plus. What if we wanted our inductor voltage? I'm going to put here VL of T, right? So if we scroll back up to our original circuit diagram, we can see that VL of T is the exact same thing as VR of T, except that it's of the opposite polarity. So I could say that VL of T is just negative VR of T, which would be negative VR at zero plus times E to the minus R over LT for T greater than or equal to zero plus. And that negative VR is really just our inductor voltage at T is equal to zero plus times negative R over L times time. Our resistor current and our inductor current are literally the exact same thing, so I'm not going to bother with that. What I'm getting at here is if our inductor current observes this form of being an exponential decay, then all of our other signals have to observe that same form as well, right? Due to Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. If one thing is exponentially decaying, everything has to be exponentially decaying, okay? So what we can say then is that generically, y of t, where y represents any current or voltage in our system will be equal to y at zero minus or t less than zero minus, and it'll be y at zero plus e to the negative r over lt for t greater than or equal to zero plus. So we effectively have a generic equation that will work for any RL network. Okay. So let's put this into use. Give me just a moment. I'm going to find a quick problem and we're going to apply this thing here. Are you there? To, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so are the the circuits that we've been observing that do have inductors so far, I guess, would they fall under the category of everything bef like in the T less than zero minus category? So that depends. I, I know that you're not going to like that answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So T less than zero minus represents DC steady state. So if you had a circuit that contained only DC sources and also contained inductors and resistors, then yes. But if the circuit did not contain DC sources, then the answer is no. So for these transient analysis problems, we are going to we are looking at how the circuit transitions 
from one DC steady state condition for T less than zero minus to a second DC steady state condition at T greater than infinity, okay? So in a transient analysis problem, we are only going to be dealing with DC sources, but we also have to have some sort of switch or something like that, which is causing a change, which will make the, uh, the circuit undergo a transient condition. There are other types of steady state, right? We can have sinusoidal steady state where everything is sinusoidally oscillating at the exact same frequency and all of that kind of good stuff. None of the signals are really changing or because they're all changing at the exact same rate, it doesn't really look like it's changing at all kind of things. That's what the last portion of this class is actually all about is sinusoidal steady state analysis. Um, for the purposes of this class, the transient analysis is uh, transient analysis is going to stop with these DC circuits. So going from one DC steady state to another DC steady state. In fact, um, in the upper level electrical engineering classes, you don't really deal with transient analysis um, directly. You wind up doing uh, using like things like Laplace transforms and all that kind of stuff to describe transient problems um, using time varying sources just because the math gets so wildly difficult. So, all right. So here is um, our example problem. And I am going to walk you guys through a step-by-step -step procedure. Okay, so here is our circuit of interest. We have a current source. Uh, this will be a five amp source. It is connected in parallel with a two ohm resistor. Here we have a terminal of our switch. Let's call this A. Here is terminal B. Down here, we are going to have another resistor. Uh, this one is going to be seven ohms. Here's our switch. So it's starting closed at A and it will close at B whenever our switch changes states. Let's put a 10 ohm resistor here. A three ohm resistor here. And then across the top here, Let's put a one hundred and fifty millihenry inductor. Okay. All right, so I want us to determine. the voltage drop across that three ohm resistor and the current flowing through our 150 millihenry inductor as a function of time. So I wanna take a quick side note here um, to let you guys know you're not always going to be asked to directly solve for the inductor current in a circuit like this, um, but you have to know what it's doing in order to analyze a circuit. So even if you aren't asked for it, you always need to solve for inductor current too, okay? 
you're going to have homework problems and in-class assignment problems that don't specifically say, hey, find out what's going on with the inductor, but you need to do that for any transient analysis problem. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce you guys to my process here, all right? So step number one. is analyze the circuit at t is equal to zero minus. So we always have to start by analyzing the circuit at t is equal to zero minus, specifically because we need to know what the inductor is doing at this point in time. Since the inductor current cannot change abruptly, we cannot correctly analyze the circuit at t is equal to zero plus unless we know what's going on at t is equal to zero minus. So at t is equal to zero minus, um, let me redraw some things here. So we have our five amp source in parallel with our two ohm resistor. Our seven ohm resistor is, so it's not going to contribute anything, but I'm going to draw it just for the sake of drawing it. Where is our 10 ohm resistor? Here is our 3 ohm resistor. And because we're at DC steady state, we replace our inductor with a short circuit. This current here will be IL at zero minus. This voltage here will be VR at zero minus. And we need to figure out what these two quantities are. So there are always multiple different ways that we could go about this. Um, so before we start our analysis, I want to make some notes here, okay? So the first note that I'm going to make is that because our seven ohm resistor is open circuited on one leg, it's not doing literally anything, so we can ignore it. Um, because our 10 ohm resistor is in parallel with a short circuit, it is shorted out, meaning that the voltage drop across it is zero, the current flowing through it is zero, so it isn't really contributing anything either, so I'm going to cancel that one out. So it looks to me like all of my inductor current is going to flow through my 3 ohm resistor meaning that if I can find the voltage drop across my 3 ohm resistor, I can figure out what that inductor current is, or if I can figure out what that inductor current is, I can use Ohm's law to figure out what the voltage drop across that resistor is, right? So that's the situation that I have. So when I look at this particular circuit, I see two different things that are jumping out at me, okay? Uh, the first thing that I see is that I have a 5 amp source in parallel with a 2 ohm resistor, effectively in parallel with a 3 ohm resistor, because that short circuit bypasses that 10 ohm resistor. Let me show you this, and let me use a different color. Let's do this up here. This is all one node.
And this is all one node. So that means that if I were interested in finding that current IL directly, this would be a prime candidate to apply current division because I have a current source in parallel with two resistive paths, right? which is a bread and butter current division calculation. Another way to think about it is that all of these three things are in parallel, which means they all share the same voltage. So I could find that voltage VR just by applying Ohm's law, excuse me, five amps times the equivalent resistance of those two resistors connected in parallel would give me V. And then, like I said earlier, once I know V, I could use Ohm's law to find IL. I'm going to choose the current division route just because you guys have had less exposure to that. And so a little bit of practice wouldn't hurt. So using current division, I can say that I L at zero minus is going to be five amps times one over three ohms divided by one over two ohms plus one over three ohms, which if my mental math is correct, should be two amps. Let me just double check things on a calculator here to make sure I'm not telling tales. Yeah, yep. Now, using Ohm's law, VR at zero minus is three ohms times IL at zero minus, which will just be six volts. For a more complicated circuit, I guess technically we could have done mesh or nodal here, but it would have been, in my opinion, overkill. Um, but really for this circuit analysis at T is equal to zero minus, you just do whatever circuit analysis technique makes the most sense to you to find our quantities of interest at this particular point in time. So before we move along to our next step, any questions about the analysis for this particular part. All right. So assuming we're all on the same page there, we move on to step number two. analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero plus. So at T is equal to zero plus, our switch is now V. So what that's going to look like, we're gonna have our five amp source here, connected in parallel to our two ohm resistor. Terminal A is now going to be open circuited. Uh, 
Uh, this is a seven ohm resistor, if memory serves me correctly. Here is our 10 ohm resistor. Over here is our three ohm resistor. And then our inductor is gonna be over the top here. So I'm gonna do something here, which is gonna seem a little bit odd. I'm gonna ask you guys to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to represent my inductor as a current source, okay? So my current source needs to have the same direction as the current IL. So that means it's gonna be directed to the right. And it's also going to have the same magnitude as the current IL, which means that it's going to be two amps, right? So I'm just gonna make a little note here that this is IL at zero plus. And this is VR at zero plus. So let me talk very briefly about about why I'm choosing to represent my inductor as a, so at T is equal to zero plus. So we're not talking about T greater than zero plus, just this very specific instant in time, the current flowing through our inductor is fixed. It cannot change. What's the element where the current doesn't change? A current source. So we are just, using this current source to effectively remind us that the current flowing through the inductor at this particular instant in time is a fixed quantity. So I'm going to make a note out here. I L at zero plus must be equal to I L at zero minus or two amps. We don't have to do any analysis whatsoever to find that. That's just the way inductors work. So the only analysis that we're going to need to do here is to figure out the voltage drop across our three ohm resistor. So multiple different ways that we could do this. Um, to me, I see a two amp source in parallel with a 10 ohm resistor in parallel with a branch containing three ohms in series with seven ohms. Um, so two uh, amps in parallel with 10 ohms in parallel with 10 ohms means that the current flowing through either of those 10 ohm branches is one amp. And then from there, the voltage drop is gonna be three times one is three volts. Um, you could also do other things, but I try to avoid using nodal and mesh unless I absolutely need to do it. Okay. So, um, let me formally do this here. So, I'm going to call this current IR at zero plus and using current division i r at zero plus will be two amps times one over three ohms plus seven ohms divided by one over 10 ohms plus one over three ohms plus seven ohms. Which will come out to be one amp. And then using Ohm's law,
Br at zero plus will be three ohms times Ir at zero plus is three volts. All right, so I'm going to write a step down here. Um, and this step is really like it's it's not going to be needed for this particular circuit, but we will need to do this step later on when we see switches effectively going in the opposite direction. So I'm just going to do this step here just so that I don't have to amend our procedure for more difficult circuits. So step three, is going to be analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity. So let me scroll way back here for just a moment to explain what we're doing here. Okay. So if we look at this diagram on the bottom right-hand corner of this page, at T is equal to infinity and beyond, our circuit has entered that second DC steady state, right? So the transient condition is what's going on between the two DC steady states. So at t is equal to infinity, our switch has changed states, but our circuit is at DC steady state. Okay. So at t is equal to infinity, for our circuit of interest, it's going to look something like this. Right? Here we have our 5 amp source in parallel with our 2 ohm resistor. We have an open circuit at terminal A. Here's our seven ohm source, excuse me, seven ohm resistance. Our 10 ohm resistor. Three ohm resistor. Because we're at DC steady state, our inductor looks like a short circuit, where this is IL at infinity. And this is VR at infinity. So the reason why we don't actually need to do this for this particular circuit is we can look at this thing and see well, our network that contains the inductor doesn't actually contain any sources whatsoever. So by inspection, IL at infinity is zero amps. And VR at infinity is zero volts. So we're at a point in time where all of the energy that was stored by the inductor has been converted into heat. When we work circuits that contain sources at T is equal to infinity, we won't get zero for both of our answers here. So for this particular circuit, like I said, largely a waste of time because we knew that the answers were going to be zero, but later on it will be important. All right, step number four. We need to determine the equivalent resistance and inductance 
of the circuit during the transient condition. That is very important that we look at the circuit during the transient condition, okay? So not before the switch has changed states or we're gonna wind up getting the wrong answer. All right, so let's start with the easy one here. Uh, I firmly believe that LEQ is 150 millihenries because it's the only inductor in the circuit. So that one's pretty straightforward. To find REQ, we are going to find the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen by LEQ. So during the transient condition, so let, let's just go through this step by step. During the transient condition, I have a five amp source in parallel with a two ohm resistor. This terminal is open circuited. Here I have a seven ohm resistor. Ten ohm resistor. A three ohm resistor and then up here is my inductor don't draw the inductor because we're just going to erase it in a moment i'm just walking you through the steps here okay. so this is what my circuit looks like during the transit condition because i'm finding the equivalent resistance seen by the inductor I take the inductor out and I look in through the terminals left behind by the inductor at a dead network. So we are literally just finding the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen by the inductors. So what do I see? Well, I see 10 ohms in parallel with three in series with seven. Which is 10 in parallel with 10 or five ohms. Finding the equivalent resistance is one of the things that you students struggle with the most for, for whatever reason. So I just want to reiterate, you're doing it during the transient condition, and it's just that they have an equivalent resistance. So it's something that you've done before. The mistake that I see the most is students effectively trying to do this for the circuit at T is equal to zero minus. If you look at the circuit at T is equal to zero plus and just take the inductor out, you're doing it correctly. Because T is equal to zero plus represents the beginning of the transient condition. All right, we're finally on our last step. So step number five. We are going to plug things in to our generic equation. So to remind you, our generic equation is as follows, y at zero minus for t less than zero minus, y at zero plus, e to the negative r over l t for t greater than or equal to zero plus. So for our inductor current,
we are going to have two amps for t less than zero minus, because if we go back a while here, IL at zero minus was two amps. And then here, we're going to have two, because IL at zero plus was two, E to the negative R five ohms divided by 150 millihenry T amps for T greater than or equal to zero plus. So just for the sake of argument here, five divided by 0 0.15 is 33 and a third or 100 over three. So I could clean this up and say that this looks like two e to the negative 100 over three t amps or t greater than or equal zero plus. For VR, we are going to have six volts for T less than zero minus. And then we're going to have three E to the negative hundred thirds T volts for T greater than or equal to zero plus. Because all of the signals are gonna exponentially decay at the same rate. So, so sorry, where, where did six volts come from again? Okay. So if we look here at T is equal to zero minus, we found that VR was six volts. So that's where that came from. At T is equal to zero plus, VR was three volts. So that's where that came from. Here's LEQ, here's REQ, and we found that REQ divided by LEQ is the same thing as 100 over three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for this last step, we are literally just taking the results of our previous steps and plugging it into this generic equation. That's all we're doing. No new analysis or anything like that. We're just taking the stuff that we already found and plugging it. Okay, so this was an RL circuit. This methodology will work for every RL circuit where we can break the inductance down into a single equivalent inductance and break the resistance down into a single equivalent resistance, okay? which will be every circuit that I give you, just to be really clear here. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at RC circuits, okay? So same concept, but now instead of having an inductance, they'll have a capacitance. So let's say that we have the following circuit. We have some voltage source, switch that is going to open at T is equal to zero, connected to some resistance R. And some capacitance C. Where This is the voltage drop across our capacitor. 
And then secondary things might be the current flowing through our capacitor or the current flowing through our resistor. The voltage drop across our resistor is literally going to be the exact same thing as the voltage drop across our capacitor, so I'm not going to bother rewriting that. They're in parallel, so it has to be. Okay, so I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly because it is extraordinarily similar to what we saw for the inductors. So at T is equal to zero minus, our circuit is at DC steady state. So we're going to have our voltage source Vs in parallel with our resistance R in parallel with our capacitor. But because we're at DC steady state, our capacitor is going to look like an open circuit. This is going to be Vc at zero minus. Since all three elements are in parallel, it stands to reason that Vc at zero minus is simply equal to Vs. And because the voltage drop across our capacitor isn't zero, our capacitor is going to have some amount of energy stored that will be one half C times Vc squared. So our capacitor has some amount of stored energy. Once our switch opens up, our capacitor is going to transfer its stored energy to the resistor, which will eventually convert it into heat. So it's the exact same situation that we had previously, but now it's the capacitor's stored energy that's getting converted into heat. So For T greater than or equal to zero plus, our system looks like this. We have our voltage source. Our switch is open, so it's no longer connected to our RC network. Here's R. Here's C. Here's Vc of T. Ic of T. And Ir of T. If we perform Kirchhoff's current law, we'll find that Ir plus I C have to equal zero. And I can put both of these quantities in terms of my capacitor voltage. So my resistor current is just going to be VC divided by R. And then my capacitor current is going to be C. times the derivative of the voltage with respect to time is equal to zero. So we once again have a first order homogeneous differential equation. So I'm going to guess that my capacitor voltage will be of the form AE to the ST, just like we did for the inductors. Substituting this in, we are going to have one over R times A E to the S T plus S C A E to the S T is equal to zero or A times one over R plus S C 
e to the st is equal to zero, where this is our characteristic equation now. And in this case, S will need to be equal to negative R times C in order to make everything zero. Okay. So that means that VC will be VC at zero plus E to the negative R, excuse me, um, I made a mistake here. One over RC. My apologies. Like so. So it's effectively the exact same form, except that the rate of decay is now dependent on the resistance and the capacitance instead of the resistance and the inductance. Right. So exact same concept, which means we're going to analyze our circuit using effectively the exact same steps, except that now we're going to, our step four is going to be find REQ and CEQ. So um, because we only have 20 minutes left of class, I'm going to find a quick-ish capacitor problem that we can work. So let's put this down here. Let's say that we have a 12 volt source. connected to a 30 kilo ohm resistor. Here's a switch terminal. Let's call this one um, A. Let's call this one B. This is a 120 kilo ohm resistor. Our switch is closed at A before closing at B at T is equal to zero. Over here, we are going to have a 60 kilo ohm resistor. And then over here, finally, we have a 100 microfarad capacitor. Let's say that we're trying to find VC and IR. So that's number one. Analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero minus. At T is equal to zero minus, our switch is closed at position A and we are at DC steady state. So that means that we are going to have something that looks like this. So volts in series with 30 kilo ohms. Our terminal B is just going to be open circuited. Here's IR at zero minus.
kiloohms. Because we are at DC steady state, our capacitor looks like an open circuit. So this is going to be VC at zero minus. So hopefully we can see that IR at zero minus in this particular case must be zero amps because that resistor is open circuited, so no current can flow through. Um, to find C, I am going to choose to do voltage division here. So VC at zero minus is going to look like 12 volts times 60 kilo ohms over 30 kilo ohms plus 60 kilo ohms. So two thirds times 12, I believe is eight volts. For step number two, we are going to do the exact same thing that we did before. We're going to analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero plus. So at T is equal to zero plus, our switch is now moved from being closed at position A to being closed at position B. So we are going to have our 12 volt source. And then our 30 kilo ohm resistor here will be open circuited. The terminal here. This is our 120 kilo. Boom. Connected in parallel to our capacitor. And at T is equal to zero plus, I'm going to represent my capacitor with a voltage source because we know that the voltage drop across a capacitor cannot change abruptly. So if the voltage was eight volts at T is equal to zero minus, it must be fixed at eight volts at T is equal to zero plus. So just as a note here, VC at zero plus must be equal to VC at zero minus, which is eight volt. And using Ohm's law, IR at zero plus is just going to be eight volts divided by 120 kilo ohms. My mental math is correct. Um, eight over 12 is two thirds. So two over 30, one fifteenth of a milliamp, if I'm not mistaken, let me check this out. All right.
Yep, 115th of a mile. Um, we're going to skip step number three, analyzing the circuit at t is equal to infinity because the answers are just going to be zero. It's going to have no effect and we are pressed for time. Uh, so step number four. will be to find REQ and CEQ during the transient condition. So CEQ is 100 microfarads because it's the only capacitor in the circuit. Let me just double check. That's the right number. To find REQ, we need to look at our circuit during the transient condition. So here is our 12 volt source connected to 30 kilo ohms. There's our capacitor. We take the capacitor out, leaving behind an open circuit set of terminals and look in at a dead network, which means I'm gonna turn my 12 volt source off. And so I see 120 in parallel with 60. Um, so let's see, 12 is 72 over 18, four. So if my mental math is correct, that's 40 kilo ohms. Yep. And now we are ready for step number five. Plug stuff into our equation. So for RC circuits, our generic equation is as follows. Y of T is equal to Y at zero minus for T less than zero minus and Y at zero plus E to the negative T divided by RC for t greater than or equal to zero plus. So we see is going to look like eight volts for t less than zero minus, and it will be eight e to the let's see here. Um, so. T divided by 40 times 10 to the 3 times 100 times 10 to the minus 6. T over 4, excuse me, negative. T over 4 volts for T greater than or equal to 0 plus, which I would probably call this 8e to the negative 0 0.25t volts for t greater than or equal to 0 plus, just because I'm not real big on fractions in my exponentials, but anyway. Um, and 
I R, excuse me, of T. would be zero amps for T less than zero minus, and it would be one fifteenth E to the negative 0 0.25 T milliamps for T greater than or equal to zero plus. All right, uh, I know we went through that very quickly. Um, but if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Uh, the, the first question that comes to mind is, could, could you go back over on your VC right here, down a little bit, in step five, sorry, for oh, the five. Mm -hmm. You have T negative T over four. I, 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 did, I couldn't write that down. What was the whole... Um, expression there rather than the so simplified version so it is eight e to the negative t over four volts that's it where that over four comes from the divided by rc where mm -hmm. r is forty thousand, and c is a hundred times ten to the minus six okay Okay. So let me just make a quick note here. This four is just R E Q times C E Q. Okay. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Um. And, and then so for, like, if we're asked, like, you know, what 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 is the conductance or inductance at a specific time? We just plug that T in, into these formulas. And then we should know what that value is at that time. Is that the idea? Well, so when you say conductance or inductance at a specific time, like the inductance isn't going to change and the capacitance isn't going to change. It's only the voltage and current waveforms that are varying with time. Okay, okay. 